Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about autoimmune disease. How prevalent is it? What are the different stages of autoimmune disease? And how do we figure out if we actually have autoimmune disease? So let's get right into it. Autoimmune disease. In 2019, it was estimated that 1 out of 12 women has an autoimmune condition. 1 out of 24 men has autoimmune disease. National Institute of Health estimates 23.5 million Americans have one of the autoimmune diseases. American Autoimmune Related Disorder Association estimates 50 million Americans have autoimmune disease. My guess is that it's probably even higher than that, likely one out of five uh, uh, Americans probably have autoimmune disease. Okay. Now, what is autoimmune disease? There's greater than 80 different autoimmune diseases that are identified at this time. You have lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel uh, disease, or uh, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, pernicious anemia, right? There's a lot of them, diabetes, MS. So there's a multitude of these autoimmune processes that go on and it's hard for people to figure out what's going on with them when they first develop it. So let's get right into the different stages. So autoimmune disease. During stage one, it's called silent autoimmunity. This is when you may have a positive test for a antibody to a tissue. For example, if you have thyroid issues, you may have a positive TPO or TG antibody, but you do not exhibit any symptoms. So you have an elevated an uh, antibody, but you have no symptoms or no noticeable tissue loss. There's no impact on the thyroid itself, okay? When you have stage two autoimmune reactivity, you have elevated antibodies. So in, we're gonna use the example of thyroid. You have an elevated TPO or TG antibody but you have some symptoms. Symptoms like hair loss, dry skin, loss of one third or a lateral one third of the eyebrow, right? constipation, fatigue. So you have some noticeable symptoms, but you don't have any tissue loss. The thyroid is still intact, okay? But you're, you're exhibiting overt symptoms. Stage three autoimmune disease is elevated antibodies with symptoms, like with a thyroid, all those symptoms, plus tissue loss. So you might have inflammation of the thyroid, noticeable, you can see it. Uh, when they do an ultrasound, you can see thyroiditis or inflammation of the thyroid. So these are different ways you can identify uh, the early stages and then identify the late stages. Now, if you have family history, a strong family history of autoimmune disease, you should get checked for that particular autoimmune disease, okay? A good screening test when you just come in and you're not sure. You come in and I go, I have an autoimmune disease, or I think I might have an autoimmune disease, but we don't know which one it is and what to do about it, right? So one thing you can do is check something called ANA, anti-nuclear antibody or antigen, right? Anti-nuclear antibody. So you can check that. It doesn't give you a specific diagnosis of an autoimmune disease, but if this is elevated, it gives you an idea that there might be something lurking. So you can be sent to a rheumatologist and they can run a bunch of different tests based on family history and symptoms if you have any and determine if you have an autoimmune process going on, right? Now, you can do individual testing. So if your mom or grandma or someone had a thyroid problem or rheumatoid arthritis, you can run specific antibodies for that condition, okay? So in the silent autoimmune stages, you're just kind of finding out that you have an antibody but no symptoms. Now, when people come into my office, right, we look for triggers for autoimmunity. What triggered this autoimmune condition? It can be a variety of different things, okay? Usually, uh, when young girls start to have their first menstruation, it changes hormonal um, fluctuations and it can trigger an autoimmune disease. Also, when women go from being pregnant to giving birth, it can also 
uh, trigger autoimmune disease. Another one is when you go into menopause and you have a drop in hormones. So this hormonal fluctuations can be a trigger for an autoimmune condition. Also, stress or traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress uh, can be impacting autoimmune processes. Lack of sleep, food proteins, gluten, dairy, soy, nightshades, lectins, different types of food proteins can also be a trigger for autoimmune disease because these foods are, a lot of them are uh, GMO or gene uh, hybridized, use a lot of glyphosates and chemicals and pesticides that laden the entire product it can be another trigger for autoimmune disease. You being sick with like a specific condition and you went somewhere and you had uh, issues with your bowel and you had giardia or something can also trigger autoimmune disease. Things like chemicals, um, Pollutants can also trigger autoimmune disease. Uh, plastics, BPA, can also trigger autoimmune disease. Uh, exogenous hormones can also do it. So there's a lot of different triggers that can uh, trigger autoimmune disease. You just need to figure out which one it is. Or sometimes it's just about cleaning things up, right? Cleaning up your environment. Reducing EMF exposures from cell phones, well, uh, cell phone towers, Wi-Fi, etc clean eating, like an autoimmune paleo diet, you can do a lot of different things to help yourself uh, in terms of uh, reducing the inflammatory response due to autoimmune disease. Now, if you have an autoimmune disease, let's say you have rheumatoid arthritis, is that a curable disease? Probably not. What I'm going to say is that you can put it into remission, meaning you can do all the lifestyle changes, uh, remove all the different triggers, uh, sleep well, eat well, etc. And you can push an autoimmune disease into remission. However, if you get back into your bad habits and do all the things that you know, got you to the point of autoimmunity, then it can come back. So I would say for most people who have autoimmune disease, you are a recovering autoimmune patient, not a patient who is uh, completely rid of autoimmune disease. So you always have to be kind of conscious uh, of what you're doing and eating and, and, and so forth, right? So testing-wise, you can do that. Um, there's another uh, company called Cyrex Labs, okay? It's uh, Cyrex Labs, okay? Now, this lab will do what we call predictive antibodies. They can screen for a multitude of different autoimmune conditions in one test. It's a great test to do because if you suspect that you have autoimmune disease, you can do this test and run a whole bunch of different antibodies and make it reasonably uh, priced because uh, if you do individual ones through a regular lab, the price gets exorbitant. So it, it just gets out of hand. So you can, do, uh, you can go to cyrexlabs.com and you can check uh, and look at some of Dr. Vijdani's work. Um, a lot of this stuff information that I do give you um, this is coming from Dr. Uh, Karazian. Um, I studied under him and I've taken all his courses. So there's a lot of really good information out there uh, regarding autoimmune disease. At the end of the day, you have to clean up your environment, your food, your sleep, stress, etc., and then push things into autoimmune remission. Today we're going to talk about vitamin D and the prevention of autoimmune disease. There's a great study out of Boston uh, with researchers from Harvard and Brigham and Women's. So they did a very good study on a, uh, basically a double-blind placebo study. And they had a large number of participants and the follow-through was pretty good over the five years. So let's go ahead and discuss uh, what the study said. There was 25,871 participants over a five-year period and it was a double-blind placebo study. 12,786 men greater than or equal to the age of 50 were the participants, and then 13,085 women greater than or equal to 55 years old. Now, the participants were selected from the United States, and one of the requirements was that they were not uh, taking in more than 800 milligrams of vitamin D in food sources or supplementation, and the other requirement was that they forego fish oil supplementation. Okay, so they were not on fish oil, 
and they were only taking 800 milligrams of vitamin D, if any, uh, or lower. Now, they split the group into four different groups. One is omega-3, a placebo, and a vitamin D placebo. So they were getting two pills with just placebos. Then you had an active group for omega-3 and an active vitamin D group. So basically, they took omega-3 and vitamin D together in that group. Another group had omega-3 placebo and a vitamin D active form. And the other group had omega-3 active and a vitamin D placebo. So they were able to determine whether vitamin D and omega made an impact, or just omega, or just vitamin D, or placebo, and look at it, look at it and compare all four subsets. Now, if we just get right to it and look at the conclusion, okay, the conclusion of vitamin D supplementation with or without omega-3s for five years reduced autoimmune disease by 22%, okay? And then omega-3 supplementation with or without vitamin D reduced autoimmune disease by 15% which actually they don't consider statistically significant, but 22% is. Now, why does vitamin D impact autoimmune disease? Because there are cells, immune cells, that have rich receptors for vitamin D or the active forms of vitamin D. So vitamin D receptors are found in high density in dendritic cells, basically nerves, and then T and B cells, uh, lymph T and B lymphocyte cells, and macrophages. So when you look at it, they have high levels of receptors for the active form of vitamin D. And vitamin D, or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, will impact the um, immune system, right? So I like to explain it as like what we call Th1 and Th2, right? Th1, and this is a very simplistic model. Th1 is when you have like an active infection, virus, bacteria, whatever it is, you have an immune response. Th2 is like the humoral response, uh, basically the memory of the infection. So they need to be in balance. Okay? And there is another section where it's called T regulatory cells, and these are the referees of the two systems, trying to keep everything in balance. And Vitamin D really impacts the T regulatory cells that keeps the Th1 and Th2 systems in balance, okay? So, interesting thing. They use colcalciferol, which is vitamin D3, at 200 IUs per day, okay? And the placebo was soybean oil. So they made a capsule with vitamin D and another one with soybean as a placebo for some patients. And this product was produced by Pharmavite, which makes nature-made uh, supplements or vitamins, okay? The, the reason I say that's interesting is because oftentimes when you go to your doctor and you're low on vitamin D, they uh, supplement with D2, not D3, right? So in this study, they actually used D3, and they only used 2,000 units. The marine omega-3, which they used, they used 1,000 milligrams of basically omega-3s, and of the omega-3s, EPA was 460, and DHA was 380. So the EPA-DHA portion was actually less than the total amount, um, but this is really what's gonna impact the autoimmune process. The placebo for that was olive oil. So, the fish oil was produced or provided by Pronova Biopharma. They make Lavaza. A Lavaza is a prescription fish oil. It's a ethyl ester form. So basically it's been changed so it can be patented and utilized as a pharmaceutical. The more natural form would be the triglyceride forms. Now you can argue that um, Lavaza is more purified and it has more quality control, but it's also more expensive. The triglyceride forms you can get 
from you know over the counter and so forth and there are some issues with that in terms of being rancid and not having the quality uh, or quality control that a pharmaceutical uh, grade would have. However, you can't find companies that have high quality fish oil uh, that is not rancid. So, it's an ethyl ester form. So, even using these, you can see that it has an impact on the autoimmune process or or the prevalence of showing up later on. Now, I like to talk about, outside the study, how can we improve this even further, right? They've only used 2,000 international units of vitamin D3 to make an impact on autoimmune disease, which is 22%, right? Um, an improvement of 22%. What if they used higher doses and actually monitored um, vitamin D levels to try to get into its optimal levels. My optimal level is between 60 and 80. They did do a follow-up, a one-year follow-up, where they were giving the patients 2,000 units, and they did see an increase of somewhere around the upper 20s to around the 40 range over a year period. But what if you used higher doses and got that range up to 60 and 80? Okay. Would that impact the outcome? Also, instead of using the ethyl ester form of the fish oil, what if they use the triglyceride form, which is the more natural form, right? It's not a pharmaceutical uh, changed uh, component. So what if they use a triglyceride form to impact that? Uh, would the outcome be better? And I don't know. What if they also used a younger population? Because in clinical practice, we often see autoimmune disease in, in younger and younger patients. And to prevent autoimmune disease, if you start it earlier on, you can have a bigger impact. So if they also had a younger population, not over 50, uh, and did a follow-up study on that, would it make a bigger difference in terms of the outcome? Also, there are other nutrients that impact the T-regulatory cells. So vitamin D is very important, ideal level 60 to 80 nanograms. And uh, fish oil, I think, is important for that also. And the other component would be glutathione, or NAC, or NAC, right? Liposomal glutathione would be great, or NAC would also impact the T regulatory cells and probably increase the out, uh, better outcome for this study. So if they did a study and they really looked at all the nutrients that would impact the T regulatory cell or the immune cells in a positive way and used a combination of those, would the outcome be better? Uh, my guess would be yes, because we do it all the time in the office. We have patients who come in with autoimmune disease and we can put them into remission over time, uh, which is great. Um, or even thinking about prevention, right? prevention of autoimmune disease. So mom and dad has an autoimmune disease and we have the child come in. Can we prevent them from getting autoimmune disease? It's not just about supplementation, obviously. You have to be able to reduce stress and all the different triggers of autoimmune di autoimmunity, autoimmune disease. Um, you have to also look at hormonal fluctuations. You have to look at food because food has such a big impact on autoimmune disease, especially gluten and dairy. So uh, it, this was a great study because it's, it's just kind of touching the surfaces of vitamin D impacting uh, autoimmune disease. But if you combine all the things that we know that can help, I think the outcome can be even better. But it's just about uh, compliance with patients and getting patients to do all these things that you want them to do, especially a large number of patients like this. Um, but this was a great study. Today we're going to talk about autoimmune disease triggers. Things like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, etc. So let's get right into it. Lyme disease, dietary proteins, lifestyle choices, and stress can all impact autoimmune disease. SARS-CoV-2, infections, and chemicals, and many, many factors can impact the immune system in autoimmune disease. So why do people get autoimmune disease? Partly genetics, and the vast majority of them will have some sort of trigger. Autoimmunity is incurable, 
What that means is that you can probably drive it into remission, however it's always lurking underneath. So what are our clinical goals when autoimmune disease is incurable? Improved diet, lifestyle, nutrition, and then you have to remove the triggers, right? You have so many symptoms, and oftentimes you go to your doctor and they don't really listen. You get fed up with feeling unheard after visiting your doctor, right? So go to my sponsor today. It's trywelltheory.com forward slash Dr. Jin and get $50 off your first month. So here's a word from our sponsor. Welcome to Well Theory, the place for autoimmune patients. There are over 50 million autoimmune patients in the United States. And oftentimes when they come into the office, they have a multitude of symptoms. GI issues, skin issues, uh, brain fog, joint pain. Yet, when they go to their doctor's appointment, they often get only 15 minutes of their time and often leave with a prescription medication. Or they're sent for a consultation with a specialist who will probably give them another medication. Well Theory was built for autoimmune patients by autoimmune patients. What that means is the founder of Well Theory has autoimmune disease herself and she's figured out a way to help manage autoimmune patients. And many of the practitioners on Well Theory also had autoimmune disease, and now they're helping other patients who have autoimmune disease. Well Theory provides a personalized dietary plan, a supplementation plan, as well as a sense of community. They give you one-on-one -on -one consultations twice per month and they give you access to alternative or functional medicine testing. Well Theory membership program is $125 per month and it's a money back guarantee in the first month. So you try it for one month and if you don't like it, you can quit at any time and ask for a refund for that first month. If you go to trywelltheory.com forward slash Dr. Jin, your first month will be $75. And again, it's a money back guarantee for that first month. Why is Well Theory different? It's a research-based program, okay? They're trying to help 50 million Americans. Through diet and nutrition and one-on-one -on -one consultation and continual support, they can help a lot of different patients. They work on the five uh, pillars for health. So under health, you need proper sleep, stress, nutrition, movement, and a community. These are not individual pillars. They all work together. You need to have all five pillars to help recover from autoimmune uh, processes and to recover your health. That's why that one-on-one -on -one consultation with a qualified practitioner is crucial and they do it twice per month with a customizable plan and access to functional medicine testing. It's a great foundational uh, program for people who have autoimmune disease. So go ahead and check out trywelltheory.com forward slash Dr. Jin. I'll put the link below. What are the lifestyle triggers? Let's get right into it. Poor sleep, lack of exercise, stress, and relationships. Oftentimes people have things like sleep apnea or hypoglycemia and they don't get the proper sleep, right? Or stress-induced poor sleep. Lack of exercise. We're not getting the movement and the endorphins and enkephalons that are released with exercise, right? Relationship. If you're in a really bad relationship and you feel stressed all the time, it's just not a good thing because your stress level will impact or trigger autoimmunity for a lot of people. Food or dietary proteins. Gluten is a big one, right? Gluten protein, dairy, lectins, which are nuts, seeds categories, nightshades like eggplant and tomatoes, as well as cross-reactive grains. These are the alternative gluten-free grains that people will eat on a gluten-free diet, 
right? So like things like rice or quinoa or gluten-free oats oftentimes will cross-react to gluten. Therefore, eliminating those can sometimes be quite beneficial. There are a lot of chemical tri triggers, pollutants, toxins, chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, personal care products, deodorants, right? They're full of chemicals and we lather this up, right? Especially women. You probably have like five to 10 different types of things that you might put on your body. So personal care products can be a trigger. Water, chlorine, fluoride, all these things can also be triggers for autoimmunity. Heavy metals, amalgams in, the, in your teeth, and then overreactive immune system. Oftentimes people have an overreaction. So if they're allergic to a food or if they have an allergy, their immune system can be quite heightened and it can create an overreactive system that can react to any of these things. Hormones, menarche. So when girls turn into women, they go through their menstrual cycle. That big hormonal shift from non-menstruating to menstruating can create a hormonal fluctuation which can trigger autoimmune processes. I often see a lot of people, a lot of young girls come in and they develop Hashimoto's thyroiditis around that 11, 12, 13, okay, when they get their first mens menses. Hormonal contracepti uh, contraceptives is big, right? So many women on contraceptives and it can create uh, hormonal issues as well as triggering autoimmune disease. Pregnancy and birth. Big fluctuation in hormones and after birth sometimes you feel tired, hair loss, fatigue. They will call it uh, what we call uh, post uh, depression, postpartum depression. However, Sometimes it can be triggering autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which will make you feel tired with hair loss, etc. Perimenopause and menopause. Again, a drop in hormones or big fluctuation in hormones is also problematic. Infections is a big one. Okay? Viruses, Epstein-Barr, cyclomegalovirus, uh, a lot of the herpes family viruses live in our body and can flare up autoimmune disease. Bacterial infections like H. pylori infections in your gut, okay? Parasites. Um, there are a lot more parasitic infections than people realize here in the United States. Although we have sanitary conditions, uh, parasitic infections uh, can get through. Uh, a lot of these communal pools, lakes can have issues with parasites. So parasites is a factor. Mold. I just did a series on mold. Mold is a big factor because it drives your immune system. Barriers, the breakdown of barriers, the gut barrier, overuse of antibiotics can create issues with your gut barrier, intestinal permeability, leaky gut, okay? So when you have a breakdown in your barriers, then you're more prone for autoimmune disease. The blood-brain barrier, a lot of people don't know about this, but when you have a concussion or head trauma, you're breaking down your blood-brain barrier, and you're going to be more susceptible for inflammatory processes that can occur uh, post-infection. You can impact that blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier needs to be intact. The lung barrier, right? Asthma, breathing issues, breathing difficulties. <clears throat> With the breakdown of the lung barrier, you're also more susceptible for autoimmune processes. Recovery. What do we do to recover from autoimmune disease? I said it's incurable, right? So things you have to do is you have to find the triggers. What are the triggers that first initially caused the problem and what is ongoing? You have to eliminate food triggers, and this can be different for everyone, right? Some people, it might be just gluten. Some people, it needs to be gluten, dairy, and soy. So it can be different for every individual. Lifestyle changes. You have to be able to sleep. You have to exercise. You have to have good relationships, right? All these things matter, okay? And 
supplementation. You need proper supplementation in order to help you get out of an acute state of autoimmune disease. One of the big factors is NAC or NAC, glutathione or lipos liposomal glutathione, vitamin D levels at the proper level at, at least 60 to 80, and then essential fatty acids are very important for modulating your immune system. So when we say, you know, improve your immune system, we're not talking about heightening it. We're talking about balancing your immune system. So it needs to learn what is appropriate in our body and what is not appropriate in our body. So we need to figure those things out. That's why it's so important to get individualized care. It's not just about, oh, you just do this and everybody with autoimmune disease will get better. Individualized care and figuring out what your triggers are and improving all the little lifestyle changes that you need to do to get better from autoimmune disease. Go ahead and share the page, like the page, and share it with family because this is very important information about diabetes. Today we're going to talk about type 1.5 diabetes. This is uh, not well known within the community or people who have diabetes, but 1.5 is an autoimmune condition. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So it's called latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, right? And it's called type 1.5 diabetes. And then for short, it's LADA, L-A-D-A. Now, people don't realize uh, when patients have diabetes or adult onset diabetes, it's not just about what they eat and what kind of diet they had or sedentary lifestyle they had, it could be an autoimmune process going on, right? Much like type one diabetes, which is diagnosed much earlier on in childhood, 1.5 can be diagnosed later on above the age of 30, okay? So let's go into some of the facts. Type 1.5 diabetes looks like type two diabetes, right? Because it starts in adulthood and then 10 to 15% of type 2 diabetes, the adult onset, may be actually 1.5 diabetes, the autoimmune version. So there's a lot of people who have diabetes, but a good percentage could still be just an autoimmune condition, not because they eat poorly and have a poor lifestyle. Now, 1.5 will start at, at an age above 30, typically, and 1.5 diabetes destroys the cells that produce insulin, okay? So when you look at 1.5, it's basically type one, but it starts in adulthood. The autoimmune condition does not manifest early on in childhood. It comes on later on. And this could be due to environmental factors, infection, and those types of things. But you have to look at these patients who come in, uh, they're not obese, they have a relatively good um, healthy eating habit, they exercise, and they're relatively thin and fit looking, right? Yet, they have diabetes and they don't understand why. Those are the patients that we wanna check for autoimmune conditions, right? So how do we go ahead and check to see if we have type 1.5 diabetes rather than just adult onset diabetes? The antibody testing, right? So you can check to see if you have the autoimmune condition. The first antibody is called GAD65 antibody. Number two, ICA is islet cell antibody testing. And then the last one here is zinc transporter antibodies. Those three markers can help you decipher whether you have regular old diabetes, that you had a poor lifestyle, you had a lot of sugar, you don't exercise, you're sedentary and so forth, versus I'm thin, I work out, I try to eat well, but I have diabetes. Then you need to run these tests. Another test you can run is the actual insulin antibody. Right? These are all labs that you can run through your traditional labs, through Quest or hospital labs or LabCorp. Right? It's not some special test that you can run through some specialty lab. It's a regular lab that you can check. So when you suspect someone has adult onset diabetes, right? you're looking at the classic example of a thin person 
who exercises and eats relatively well, yet they develop diabetes. Then you wanna go ahead and check the antibodies to make sure they don't have that. Or if they do, the management will be different. So type two diabetes management is just eating less and exercising. But those people, it doesn't control their diabetes. The type one, uh, type 1 1.5, it doesn't control their diabetes. Eventually, things like metformin, those types of medications might be prescribed, yet the diabetes will continue to progress because it's an autoimmune condition. So you have to address the autoimmune con uh, condition by finding triggers. Is there chemical issues? Is there infection, right? Is there something that's affecting the pancreas or attacking these antibodies or these um, cells in our body? It's important to find those things out so you can help manage someone who has a autoimmune diabetes or a adult onset diabetes. And today we're gonna to continue on that journey of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and autoimmune reactivity to the cerebellum or basically your brain. We're gonna look at signs and symptoms and examination findings for cerebellar dysfunction. So when we have a patient who comes in and has Hashimoto's thyroiditis and they have positive antibodies, TPO, TGV antibodies, then we need to look at patients and say, is their, cere is their cerebellum healthy, right? Do they have issues, signs and symptoms of secondary autoimmunity to the cerebellum, right? So when a patient comes in, we look at the clinical signs. We have questions and we say, do you have poor balance and stability, right? Are we a little bit off balance? When the light is off and, uh, at night and you're going to the bathroom, do you trip into things? Do you uh, bump into the wall, right? Or do you hit your hand on the corner? So we have poor balance and stability. Secondarily, we look at vertigo, or basically dizziness, right? There's different forms of dizziness, but cerebellum problems can also create uh, ataxia or dizziness. Anxiety induced with crowded places. Now, this is something that people don't realize is that when you have cerebellar issues, and let's say you go to a busy supermarket, you have a lot of visual input from the aisles and products and people walking around, right? All this visual input will throw off the cerebellum because the visual input along with the head movement, with the um, different canals or cochlea, it integrates into the cerebellum and the cerebellum will tell you, oh, I don't like this place. It's kind of too much for me. So we look at anxiety as a result, okay? Nausea with movement, right? Certain movements will create nausea, especially things like car sickness. This up and down movement of the car, stopping and going. We're looking at different canal issues that integrate into the cerebellum, as well as utricles and, and saccules, right? So we're looking at movement, and we're also looking at sickness when you're in the car, and sound and light sensitivity. So if you have all of these issues, right, you may not even realize that you have a cerebellar issue. And we need to clinically examine the patient to see, do they have a cerebellar problem, right? Are these all related to that? Or do they just have a dizziness issue, right? Maybe they have a peripheral vestibular disorder where it's the, the eardrum or a fistula or um, canal or orticonia or something in the ear, right? So we have an examination, right? When the patient comes in and if they write something and they have something called macrographia, because patients who have cerebellar issues have problems with fine motor movements, small fine movements. The handwriting becomes very big. So you so can see it, you can just huge letters, right? So you have macrographia. And then you also have a positive Romberg's. So positive Romberg's in our office is basically putting your feet together, stand there, and can you balance, right? If you want to stress the cerebellum even further, what you can do is you can do tandem Romberg's. You put one foot in front of the other and stand there. Can you do it? Or do you feel dizzy or wobbly front and back? If you close your eyes in a tandem position, this is a good one to do, so do it at home. Stand there with your feet together, and just stand there. Can you balance? Can you balance with your feet together with your eyes closed? Are you swaying all over the place? 
that can be an indication of a cerebellum issue. Then you can stress that patient and say, let's put one foot in front of the other. It's called a tandem Romberg. And then stand there. Can you do that? Right? Or can you walk heel to toe? Right? And then if you close your eyes with your feet, let's say one foot in front of the other, and you're falling over all over the place, it's an integration issue with the cerebellum. Another thing is ataxia. When you have a patient come in, we have them walk. How are they walking? So when they come in and they have ataxia, they will tend to walk with their feet a little bit wider, with the toes pointed out, and they tend to kind of swing their arm. They have hypotonia, or like the arms look like noodles, right? And then they're walking. And then when they stand there, they'll stand with a wide stand gait, meaning they'll have their feet wide apart so they can get balance, and they have good balance when their feet are apart. So what we do is we stress them by putting them in a Romberg position, putting their uh, gait into a small, narrow space. So you have wide stand gait, ataxia. Another one to do is called this kinesia. So basically you're able to alternate your movements in a rapid pace. So you can do that at home. Can you do this without missteps or, or in coordination, right? Or you can take your hand and go like this and go fast. Can you do that movement? Can you do this movement, right? It's a rapid alternating movement. Are you able to do that? Because the cerebellum basically coordinates the on and off movement of this. Another one is terminal tremor. This is a good one to do. If you have a patient stand there with your feet together, they touch your nose, and then have them reach out and touch an object or a finger. Oftentimes with people who have cerebellar issues will do this. They'll touch their nose and they'll come and as they reach out, they will start to shake. It's called the terminal tremor. When you're trying to fine tune a movement further away from your body, your body, your cerebellum is stressed. So they may have this tremor or they, as they come to their nose, they might have a tremor. Right? Or they may even have a head shape tremor, right? Because the cerebellum is coordinating the fine motor movements. So when we have a patient, we want to look at, do they have big handwriting? Do you have positive Rombergs where you have your feet together, right? Can we stand in a narrow gait? Ataxia, when you're walking, broad base gait, or they're kind of falling over. Or when you do a heel toe walk, patient is leaning all over the place. This dyadical kinesia, can you do alternating movements rapidly? Terminal tremor, is my hand shaking or not, right? Or you can even do it with your feet, right? If you try to move your foot and target something, then your foot will shake. And then the wide stands gait. These are all signs of cerebellar disease. Try it yourself, and if, you'll be pretty surprised if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I often find things like terminal tremor, dysdiotical kinesia, positive rhombos, macrographia. We will find these signs. And if we find these signs, we can run antibody testing to see if we have an autoimmune process going on in the cerebellum. So it's all connected. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, balance issues, cerebellar issues, gluten ataxia, right? These are all interrelated things. Today we're going to talk about Hashimoto's thyroiditis and how do we know what stage of autoimmunity that we are in when we have hypothyroid related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now behind me we have three phases. Oftentimes when patients come in, there are, they already know that they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. They're already in the inflamed state, their TSH is off or they've been diagnosed with, by their uh, physician, okay? So when we look at patients, we have to look at it in terms of different stages because if we can catch things early on, the outcome can be much better. So let's look at it. We have stage one, when someone comes in and they have what they call silent autoimmunity, right? What that means is that they have antibodies to their thyroid. They have their TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies that are positive, yet they have no symptoms, 
and they have no loss of thyroid tissue, right? So the labs come back normal. Everything's normal except they have an elevation of thyroid antibodies. Yet, it's silent. Second stage is when they come in, they have autoimmune reactivity. What that means is they have elevated thyroid antibodies, but they have symptoms. Symptoms of hair loss, brittle hair, constipation, fatigue, um, uh, cold intolerance, etc. Right? They have symptoms. But when they check their TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is normal. If TSH is normal in the medical model, there's nothing to do, right? Yet they are experiencing symptoms and they have elevation of their TPO and thyroglobin antibodies, right? So that is called autoimmune reactivity. Now, what happens is you have autoimmune disease, stage three. In that stage, you have elevation of TPO and or thyroglobin antibodies. You have symptoms, hair loss, constipation, weight gain, etc. You have measurable tissue destruction, right? Your thyroid is inflamed. It's tender to touch. There's destruction happening of the thyroid gland. And the elevated TSH, right? Now, here we go. TSH is normal. TSH is normal. Elevated TSH. This is when the conventional medical model, model will intervene. They will say, oh, the TSH is elevated and you need thyroid hormones, right? To bring the TSH down. By this time, tissue destruction is already occurring. Right? So when patients come in, oftentimes they're kind of in this stage, right? But what we like to do with those patients is if they have children or sisters or you know family um, um, or relatives that are close to them, is to say have them check for TPO antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies. And the reason is they might have silent autoimmunity going on, and they they have not reached this stage yet. But if you can catch a patient early on in stage one. There are a lot of lifestyle and nutritional management interventions that can be um, uh, used to help keep the autoimmunity in, in the silent stage. As we start to progress, it becomes more difficult. So if someone has elevated TSH, they might have been diagnosed five, ten years ago, they are on thyroid hormone, thyroid replacement hormone, right? And the tissue destruction continues to happen because this is an autoimmune disease and they have elevation of TPO and thyroglobinol antibodies. So they will never or possibly never get off the thyroid medications, right? But there's also interventions you can do in this third stage of autoimmunity, right? So it's very important to decipher where we are in the three stages of autoimmunity for Hashimoto's thyroiditis and make your interventions early on rather than waiting for the TSH to be elevated to be diagnosed or treated. Hashimoto's disease and food. What kind of diet would be the best for me? That is the million dollar question, right? There are so many different diets out there regarding thyroid health or just weight loss. So let's kind of delve into this. There are ketogenic diets, there are dairy-free diets, gluten-free diets, pescatarian diets, vegans, vegetarians, right? So what kind of diet would be ideal or the best suited for Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Now, this is a generalization. It's not a one-size-fits-all. However, in general, what I find is that the autoimmune paleo diet tends to work best for Hashimoto's patients in the beginning, okay? So let me expand on this. So when we look at this, we have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and diet. We talked a lot about gluten-free, dairy-free, lectin-free, and those types of things. So basically what the autoimmune paleo diet does is it eliminates 
the highly cross-reactive foods to thyroid, and things that tend to be inflammatory, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So things to avoid, autoimmune paleo diet or AIP. Avoid gluten, all grains, right? Not just gluten containing grains, but all grains, rice, oats, millets, tapioca, teff, right? You avoid dairy, whey protein. I know there's a lot of people who use whey protein uh, for uh, weight training and so forth, but whey protein can be problematic for some patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Genetically modified proteins such as soy and corn need to be avoided. Uh, there's a different level of um, quality of food, so organic, grass-fed whenever possible, free-range whenever possible, and those types of things. Let's go on to this side. Things to avoid is lectins and nightshades. So those are your seeds, your nuts, uh, legumes, tomato, uh, uh, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Again, these types of foods tend to be inflammatory, right? So we want to be able to remove this type of food in the beginning for someone who has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And we want to have them eat a cleaner diet consisting of vegetables, plenty of fruit, healthy oils and fats, and all types of meats that are free-range, grass-fed, organic, all those types of things, right? In general, when you want to have foods, you want to have the cleanest products that you can have. But the category of foods that you want to avoid is gluten, dairy, or all grains too, uh, lectins, nightshades, soy, right? So if you can eliminate these foods for, let's say, a month or eight weeks, and see how you feel, right? Like I said, it doesn't mean that this will fit everyone's needs, but in general, a autoimmune paleo diet or AIP diet will work best for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, with given that caveat, you can't stay on a limited diet forever, right? So you have to be able to uh, add in foods uh, systematically. So that's what we call elimination diet, right? You eliminate all the foods that are inflammatory or known bad foods, and then slowly reintroduce foods to see if you have a reaction. So a reaction can be anything from a mild headache, uh, stuffy nose, um, a little bit of wheezing, fatigue, afternoon fatigue, morning headaches. It can be anything, GI symptoms, bloating, right? So you have to be very uh, meticulous in, in how you reintroduce foods and keep an a exact diary of your symptomatology. <clears throat> so this autoimmune paleo diet has actually been studied, right? They will do some uh, clinical trials and studies where they put patients who have Hashimoto's and put them a, on an autoimmune paleo diet, right? Eliminating those inflammatory foods. So the results of the study is this. The results is that it decreases CRP or C-reactive protein. So it reduces inflammatory load on our body, right? Two, it improves white blood cell count, right? It usually tends to be a bit high when you have an inflammatory process, and it normalizes white blood cell counts on this diet. Also, when they did generalized sym symptom questionnaires, they find that the general health of that patient has improved as well as their vitality, right? So they've done these studies where they take patients and they group them into autoimmune paleo diet versus your normal diet, etc. And they do find that clinically speaking, they do see improvements. So it's worth a trial, uh, worth a try to try out the diet to see if it will help you. Okay. My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. And if you want more information on autoimmune paleo, just Google it. There is tons of information, tons of recipe ideas out there. So go ahead and Google AIP diet or autoimmune paleo diet to see if that can help you uh, get on the right path of health.